So we'll, we'll you know, there's, there's stuff here for any, any kind of background. However, hearing this, one thing I want to point out up front is that the focus of this course is on analytical chemistry and analytical separations. So there's going to be very little discussion of prep scale or industrial scale chromatographic separations. Um, that, that, that's an exceedingly complex subject and, and I couldn't even begin to treat it in less than two weeks time. Um, and to the analytical type, that stuff is really not important. And we got enough important stuff to cover that, that I made a strategic decision a long time ago that I was not going to get into to, to nonlinear chromatography, which is what prep scale is all about. Uh, we, we deal here with what's called linear chromatography, and we'll do that exclusively. Although I'll talk a little bit about nonlinear so that you know when you're being bitten. Because you don't want to work under nonlinear conditions. And if you tread into those conditions, you're, you're walking into a swamp. And you don't want to be there. You want to get out of there as quickly as you can before you develop a method. OK, so um, wait a minute, I really didn't want to go there. Let's, let's just walk through this, this outline a bit, OK? Um, we're going to start off by talking about extraction equilibria. And it's a really essential subject before we get into the guts of chromatography. Um, and in particular, because extraction equilibria leads us directly to a discussion of what's called the Craig machine. And the Craig machine is actually the simplest model of chromatography. It gives us a lot of important knowledge about chromatography. Um, we're going to talk about phase equilibrium and a quantity called the distribution ratio. It's also called the partition ratio. It's also called the distribution coefficient. It's also called the partition coefficient. It's got a lot of names. Depends on what literature you're reading. If you're coming from the chemi people, it's a distribution coefficient or a distribution ratio. If you're coming from it, from the chemical perspective, it's a partition coefficient or a partition ratio. Um, and we'll learn how important that is in controlling a separation. But even more important is a number closely related to the partition coefficient, the capital K, which is the little k. And this little k now is officially, universally referred to as the retention factor. Unfortunately, the terminology was changed. Well, actually, fortunately, because retention factor makes sense. It used to be called capacity factor 10 years ago, but IUPAC has changed the nomenclature. When they changed the nomenclature, they also dropped the prime on the little k. I refuse to do that because we got enough k's as chemists. We've got rate constants, little k. We've got the Boltzmann constant, little k. And if you're lucky, we put a b underneath it. Okay? <laughs> and unfortunately, we need rate constants in this course. And we need Boltzmann constants in this course. So I'm going to stick with k prime. But if you write a paper on chromatography, the editor is going to slap your hand if you put a K prime on it. Um, we're going to deal with a single step and multiple step extractions. The Craig machine is a fancy form of multiple step extractions. So we're going to start with single extraction and double extraction and then move, move on to the Craig, the Craig machine or Craig, Craig system. And the Craig system is really equivalent to the plate model of chromatography. <clears throat> and in their theoretical paper on partition chromatography, Singh and Martin, who got the Nobel Prize in 1952 for partition chromatography, they developed the plate model. And it, I don't do it because they did it. I do it because it it's a simple way to get to a lot of answers. And it's a good thing to keep in your head when you're trying to analyze what's going on in the column. It's just a, a nice way of, of thinking about the process. 
And it doesn't involve any fancy differential equations, which is always a nice thing. Um, and we'll see that this, this model leads to the fundamental retention equation of chromatography. In other words, when is the stuff going to come out of the column? Very important question. It's, it's what she's studying how to do properly, really properly, uh, for, for a form of liquid chromatography known as gradient elution chromatography. And in the limit of having a lot of, of, of plates, the plate model has a couple of plates or it has a lot of plates, in the limit of a lot of plates you'll see that this simple model leads to the, pr the prediction that the peaks will be Gaussian in shape. It's, it's really pretty hard. It takes a lot of fairly elaborate math to do this using the other models. So this is why um, we're going we're gonna to play around with the Craig machine for quite a bit. So here's a Craig machine. We have two liquids in principle, that are immiscible with one another, here and here. And the dots represent some solute molecules. The solute is, is dissolves, to, to a certain extent, in each of those two immiscible phases. Um, let's, suppose, let's suppose that I took um, hexane as one phase and water as the other phase. They're not missable, right? And uh, in fact, uh, hexane is, he is, is lighter than water, so that would be the hexane phase and that would be the water phase. And now let's suppose we put in some compound or compounds, plural, that we want to separate. Uh, I'm going to pick on benzene and toluene, and I'm going to put them in at low concentration. Low concentration. That's going to that's gonna make sure that I'm in what's called linear chromatography region. But we'll get more into linear and nonlinear later on. Okay? Now, if I put some benzene in there, where do you think it's going to, if, if I shake this tube, where do you think most of the benzene is going to be? Which... Which liquid do you think, and this is not a trick question, <laughs> although that's, that's not beneath me. Which phase do you think benzene is more soluble in, water or hexane? It's intuitively, benzene's pretty nonpolar. Hexane is really nonpolar. Water is about as polar as you get. Like dissolves in like, right? You've heard that before about a thousand times. It's it going to turn out that you're going to find at equilibrium there's going to be a much higher concentration of hexane, excuse me, of benzene in the hexane phase than in the water phase. I've just told you the Nernst distribution law. And if I had a tablet PC, I'd be writing it on the tablet PC, but I'll, I'll write the Nernst distribution law. That's my partition coefficient. It's equal to the, the concentration of the solute A in one phase over the concentration of A in the other phase. Uh, let, me, let me take this to be the hexane phase, and I'll take this to be the water phase. That's, that's just the definition of the partition coefficient. The Nernst distribution law says that this number is going to be approximately that ratio of solubilities. Very important. It allows you to use your chemical intu intuition to predict whether things are going to be retained well or not in, in your column. 
Okay. Now, so you see the importance of the partition equilibrium right away here. We have to know whether the, the solute is going to be predominantly up here or predominantly down there. Now, in a Craig machine, the way you operate is the following. You put some sample in this tube. The first is, this is called a zeroth tube. Uh, that's for mathematical convenience. It works better if we call the first tube zero instead of one. <coughs> um, so we, we equilibrate it. We bring it to total thermodynamic equilibrium. We just shake it back and forth quite a while. You then take the top layer and you move it over to the, 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 the second tube, which is tube one. You add fresh hexane to this tube. No more solute. You don't add more solute. You only put it in at the beginning. You equilibrate here, shake it, shake it. You then take the equilibrated stuff here, move it over here. You take the equilibrated stuff here, and move it over there. You put in fresh hexane there, and so on. And tick, 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 tick. Eventually, you get to the last tube, and if, if the winds are right and there are chemical differences between the two solutes, benzene and toluene, they will have separated. In fact, if you had three solutes, you could probably separate, if they were different from one another, you could separate the three solutes. Now let's just think for a second about a single separatory funnel. Okay? Single sep funnel. Can you separate three compounds in a using a single sep funnel? Only two phases. The best you can do is have the two compounds A and B, one prefer one layer vastly and one prefer the other layer vastly. You can separate, separate, relatively separate. You can never get to purity. Ever, 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 ever get 100% pure. No way. Why can't you do that? Entropy. It requires an infinite amount of entropy to do a perfect separation. Well, by the way, some of you are going to take oral exams and final exams, hopefully someday, right? As a chemist, I'm going to tell you that when you're totally bewildered and you don't know the answer to the question, it's one of two things. The answer is either resonance or entropy. <laughs> I'm being slightly facetious. <laughs> Okay, so that's how a Craig machine works, but we've got to get into the details to understand how this becomes a model of chromatography. So before getting into the details of that, uh, we'll get into uh, single extractions and understand them a lot better. By the way, there was a time when Craig machines were actually very valuable uh, and, and used a tremendous amount. They're not used anymore because chromatography just does everything a, a lot better, uh, much, 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 much better than a crate machine ever could. Uh, but this is how the things were, were built. They were, I mean, a, a glass blower's delight. <laughs> and there's a bigger one. And you, you, you rock the thing, and the way you position it automatically brings about, you have to turn the whole thing over, but it would do, it would do all the transfers. You had to open and close stopcocks between each of them in order to get the transfer to happen. So you can imagine what a, what a piece of glassware it were. I mean, that thing probably was $5,000 worth of glassware back when $5,000 to get your really nice car. That was a while ago. Okay, so schematically, this is really a model of chromatography because we, we have a moving phase up top here, and we have a phase that's kept stationary down there. And that's, that's just like this. This is a gas chromatography where the mobile phase is a gas and the stationary phase is a liquid or a solid, uh, say some kind of adsorbent like charcoal. It's really very similar, except this is, this is highly discrete. 
0, 1, 2, 3, 4, whereas this is continuous. So we, we're going to have to make a leap somewhere to get from the discontinuous Craig machine to the more continuous thing that we call chromatography. But in chromatography, we still think of plates. And one of the key characteristics of a chromatographic column is the number of theoretical plates that are in the column. So we, 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 know, it's a dis, we know that chromatography is a continuous process, but we think of it in, this, in these discontinuous terms. Okay, so now, now we get into partition equilibria. Um, and I'm going to have to go to the overhead. And the next, yeah, that's white, so. So what we're talking about is, is this chemical process. A is our analyte, and we're equilibrating it between two phases. Can you, can you read that? Is that in focus or not? Yes. Pretty good? OK. Um, and we're going to choose to uh, write this partition equilibria as if the solute is in the water phase at the beginning and it's going to wind up in the organic phase uh, when we're done. This is just like a chemical reaction. And uh, if it were a chemical reaction, you would write the equilibrium constant as being the equilibrium ratio of the concentration of A on the product side, right? This is the right-hand side of the product side in the numerator and the reactant side in the denominator. So we'd write the partition equilibrium constant like that. OK? Now, that's true. And you would think that that K was, is all you need to tell where the stuff is going to be. Is it going to be in the water phase or the organic phase? But that's not true, because what really matters to us is not concentration, but moles of solute. We want to know how many moles of solute are in the moving phase and how many moles are in the stationary phase. Now, clearly, the ratio of the number of moles of A in the organic phase to the number of moles of A in the water phase is going to be equal to the concentration of A in the organic phase times the volume of the organic phase. And the number of moles of A in the water phase is going to be the concentration of A in the water phase times the volume of the water phase. When you're doing chromatography, you always have two phases. And they will always appear in the equations as the ratio of the amounts of the two phases won't always be volume. Sometimes we have to use weight of a, of a, sta a stationary phase rather than a volume of a stationary phase. But it'll always be a ratio of some sort. And we call this ratio the phase ratio. And about 99% of the time, that's written with the symbol lowercase Greek phi. It, it doesn't take too much thinking, but, and I want you to do it, I want you to convince yourself that this ratio is really 
the same thing as the ratio of the equilibrium mole fraction of A in the organic phase to the equilibrium mole fraction of A in the water phase. Excuse me? Can you push it up a little bit? Oh, sure. I, I, yeah. Just yell at me. I don't have one of the crankers, which I know how to use, I, but I don't know how to push the paper up on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, it's pretty easy to show this, I'm got, but I want you to do it for yourself. I'm going to give you a hint. The mole fraction of A in the mobile phase is equal to the number of moles of A, uh, excuse me, in the organic phase, is equal to the number of moles of, of A in the organic phase to the sum of the number of moles of A in the organic phase plus the number of moles of A in the war phase. That's a hint. This ratio, or this ratio, is what we call the retention factor. And it's really the retention factor that tells you where stuff is, because it tells you the fraction of the stuff in either phase. So um, chromatographers and separation science type people have, have decided that um, so, so that we can all talk to one another. Let me back up a little bit. <coughs> it was completely arbitrary of me to put the water on this side and the organic on that side. I could have put them the other way around. If I did, the, the, the number for this process would be the inverse of the number for that process. Okay? But in chromatography, we have agreed to the following uh, system of looking at things. We will always, always, always put the solute in the mobile phase on the reactant side and the solute in the stationary phase on the product side. And therefore, the, 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 the retention factor in chromatography will be the ratio of the mole fraction in the stationary phase to the mole fraction in the mobile phase. And so it will be equal to um, the appropriate equilibrium constant times the volume of stationary phase over the volume of mobile phase. And <clears throat> we represent the mole fraction in the stationary phase with P, lowercase p. So P sub A is the same thing as the mole fraction of A in the stationary phase, and Q sub A is defined as the mole fraction in the mobile phase. This is just a convention. Okay, I've got, got three more minutes here, or two more minutes. So we're set up now. We can go on now and actually do a, a useful calculation. I'm going to I'm going to pose a problem. Um, I'm going to try and separate A from B, and uh, I'm going to have one millimolar unit concentration, one millimolar concentration of A and B in a hundred mLs of some organic liquid. And I'm going to extract with water. 
I'm going to use 100 ml of water. Um, and I'm going to do the extraction this way, and I'm going to give you the equilibrium constant for the A and B processes written from water to organic, and Ka is going to be 0 0.01. And KB is going to be 1. And I want to know <clears throat> if I do this extraction, do I extract a lot or a little of A and of B? And if I do an extraction, will I be able to purify the mixture even partially? And if so, by how much? Now, what's, what's my phase ratio? Huh? See, it was a trick question. <laughs> phi, 100, 100, so phi is 1. Okay? <clears throat> K prime A is Ka times phi. Ka is 0.01. So now I'm writing. Oh, isn't that nice? I'm writing on the overhead directly now. I'm going to quit here anyway. Kb is 1. The phase ratio is the same. So the retention factor for B is 1, the retention factor for A is 0.01. Okay? Now just give me an intuitive answer. We start with the A and the B in the organic, in the organic phase and we extract with water. Which phase does A prefer, the water phase or the, the organic phase, based upon that number? It, it's, it's not going very far in that direction, is it? Yeah. Equilibrium constant is only 0.01. Not going to get a lot of product. So the A is going to prefer to stay in this phase or, uh, well, sorry, the A is going to prefer to go into the water phase, and the B, B is indifferent. It seems to like the, the both phases equally because its partition coefficient is 1. So we are going to bring about some partial separation because the water phase really likes A, or really A likes the water phase a lot. And B is a 50-50 proposition. So the water phase is going to have a very different ratio of, of A and B than the organic phase at equilibrium. So we'll, we'll stop here because I've run out of time, because I've written all over the screen. I need to wipe it off really soon. <laughs> okay, would you turn the lights back on so we don't fall down?